Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday morning. Welcome to PCH Grand Rounds. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Angus Wilfong. Dr. Wilfong is the Chief of Pediatric Neurology at uh, Barrow Neurologic Institute in Phoenix Children's Hospital. He came to us last year from Houston, Texas, from uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Wilfong is a native of Canada, and uh, he was born and raised in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. He did his uh, medical school, undergrad and medical school, and uh, uh, his residency in pediatrics in Saskatoon, uh, Saskatchewan. Then he uh, did his residency in pediatric neurology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, then on to a clinical fellowship um, in neurology, also at, at uh, Baylor. He has been uh, highly successful and proliferative in uh, extramural funding and uh, in publications, and he has uh, spoken extensively uh, around the country and around the world on topics in pediatric neurology. Please welcome Dr. Wolfong. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to spend a few moments today talking about seizures and epilepsy in children and some of the exciting new treatment options that we have to help these children. These are my disclosures, um, nothing specifically uh, related to things I'm gonna be talking about today. So these are our learning objectives, to identify children with epilepsy who may be candidates for potentially curative epilepsy surgery, understand when a minimally invasive surgical approach is possible, and compare the risks and benefits of available surgical options. So this is a logarithmic scale of the incidence of epilepsy across our lifetime. And you can see that it's particularly high in the first year of life, and that it drifts down through childhood. And this is where most of us in the room are. We're enjoying the time in our life when we're least likely to develop epilepsy. And then it starts to go up, and by about age 70, it's as common as it is in the first year of life, and then it continues to go up as we age. The causes of epilepsy out here are different than the causes here. Here it's mostly genetic causes and uh, traumatic injury from prematurity, meningitis, encephalitis, shaky baby syndrome. Um, in here it's almost all genetic. And then here it's traumatic injuries, brain tumors, and out here it's stroke and advanced stages of degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Oh, and uh, epilepsy overall affects one in 26 people. So this is a common condition. These are the treatments that we have when we meet families in the clinic with epilepsy. We always start with medicines, and we have over 30 medicines. There's one medicine that's just been approved this year. There's one to two medicines that come for epilepsy every year. The main reason why we have a lot of drugs to treat epilepsy with is we haven't yet found a good drug. So a good drug means that it works, it's safe, it doesn't have side effects, it's easy to administer, and it's inexpensive. And uh, we don't yet have a good drug for epilepsy. When drugs don't work, we explore whether we can cure the epilepsy with surgical intervention. Traditionally, we did resective surgeries. We now have a new technology that I'm gonna talk a bit about today with laser ablation. And sometimes we disconnect one part of the brain from the other and uh, leave the parts there. And the commonest disconnection procedure is a corpus callosotomy. We have a special diet that children can eat called the ketogenic diet that can be really effective in controlling seizures. And then we have electrical pacemakers that can be implanted in the body that uh, send electrical stimulation to the brain that can help control seizures. The oldest of those was vascular stimulation that came in 1997. Uh, a couple of years ago, Neuropace was approved. And around the world two years ago, deep brain stimulation was approved and it's likely to be approved by the FDA in the United States later this year. We have an internationally agreed upon definition of when drugs don't work. So that's the definition of medically intractable or medically refractory epilepsy. 
and it takes two drugs. So if a child or an adult has failed to have their seizures come under control after two appropriate drug trials, and this is the definition of what the study group in the International League of Epilepsy defined as appropriate, it means that the likelihood of additional drug trials working is vanishingly small. This was one of the trials that was included in that analysis. This study was done in Scotland in a quaternary epilepsy center. And they took 780 patients with newly diagnosed epilepsy, characterized their seizures, determined what they thought the best treatment would be for that epilepsy syndrome, and treated them for two years to see if they could get the seizures under control. And they found that with the first drug, they got half the patient seizure free. That's off to a good start. You do your best, you try your best drug, and half the people are going to be seizure free for two years. But then the numbers drop off dramatically. The likelihood of the second drug working if the first one failed was only 11%. And then cumulatively with every drug trial after that, they were only able to get another 4% seizure free. So in an optimal situation where somebody's at an epilepsy center, is on the right drug for the right kind of epilepsy, we know that they're taking it, they're under close surveillance, pill counts, drug levels. The best that we can do is to get 65% of patients seizure free in a perfect world. So I hear people say all the time, well, the incidence of intractable epilepsy is 35%. Well, that's if you're being followed in the epilepsy center. And most people in the United States don't even see a neurologist, let alone an epilepsy specialist for the management of their epilepsy. So there are people that might not be on the right drug. And then obviously for drugs to work, you have to take the drug. So this is a similar size study that looked at the real world. So this was through the Epilepsy Foundation, and they called people that are living with epilepsy, and they asked them a couple of simple questions. Are you having seizures? And how are you feeling on your medicine? You know, because we heard that we could get 65% of people seizure free. And is that what's really happening? So this is where we'd like our patients and I think if you talk to a lot of docs, they say, oh yeah, my patients are seizure free and doing great. But really only 15% of 760 patients were seizure free and feeling good with the drugs that they were taking. But then you can say, well, you know, as a group, epilepsy drugs aren't really very well tolerated. They have lots of side effects. My patients just have to put up with the side effects. So, you know, I just care if they're seizure free or not. So if you add up how many people are really seizure free, it's 17% plus 15%. So the actual number is reversed from the clinical trials. And you can see that the majority of people are having seizures and having serious side effects from their medicine. And for side effects, I'm not talking just a bit about dizziness, I'm talking about really disabling side effects on a daily basis. So if you add up the number of people that are having seizures, it's 60% and only 40% of people are really seizure free. So are there consequences to having uncontrolled seizures? Well, it can be a pretty devastating disease. Accidents are obvious. People fall down the stairs, they drown in the bathtub. Drowning is the single commonest cause of death amongst people who have epilepsy. Um, obviously, they can crash their car if they're driving and have a seizure. I keep saying that seizure medicines have side effects and they have short-term side effects and there's lots of long-term, really disabling side effects from seizure medicines. We know that uh, phenobarbital, which we do our best not to use anymore, permanently lowers a child's IQ after just a couple of months of exposure by about 10 points. Fetal exposure to valproic acid lowers the baby's IQ after they're born an average of 10 points. So these drugs have permanent and irreversible 
side effects on growing brain growth and development and intelligence, not to mention effects on bone health and weight and uh, lots of other effects. There's a huge comorbidity in epilepsy with mood disorders, and most people with epilepsy have depression, and there's high incidence of anxiety. Seizures don't make you smart, and seizure medicines don't make you smart. So children trying to go to school and learn who have an uncontrolled epilepsy have a real problem. People die from seizures, as we've been talking about, and there's lots of uh, morbidity associated with uh, the seizures and, and having epilepsy. Epilepsy is an expensive disease. The direct costs of having epilepsy with getting prescriptions filled, getting MRIs, getting EEGs, getting blood monitoring tests, is expensive, but the indirect costs and the loss of productivity to society is enormous. And then if you have uncontrolled seizures, it's very hard to stay in school. And what kind of a job can you have with sudden unpredictable and unexpected loss of consciousness or awareness? And we're a pretty proactive society. We have enablization and mobilization of handicapped populations. So you can go to a department store and have somebody greet you at the door. You can go to a fast food restaurant and see people that have obvious physical or intellectual handicaps that are gainfully employed. Well, what can you do with uncontrolled seizures? I think about a fast food restaurant with that deep fat fryer that they're cooking uh, French fries in the back. And imagine if somebody had a complex partial seizure and was stumbling around and puts their hand in the deep fat fire. Can you work in a construction site? Can you work in a warehouse? The main definition of independence in our society in a place like Phoenix, a place like Houston where I came from, is being able to drive. And if you have uncontrolled seizures, you shouldn't legally have a driver's license. So how do you get to work? What can you do if you have uncontrolled seizures? It's devastating. So how many people actually die? Well, more people die in the United States every year from seizures than from breast cancer. Breast cancer is important. It's nice to see that the NFL players wear pink uh, during uh, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But more people are dying from seizures. There should be a month where they're wearing purple. Every hour, five people in the United States will die. So just during this lecture, there'll be five deaths. And people with uncontrolled seizures are eight times more likely to die from sudden unexpected death, SUDA, or accidental injury than people with well-controlled epilepsy. So why does drug treatment fail? Why don't our drugs work? Well, some children have severe refractory and tractable treatment-resistant epilepsy. And the other reason that drug treatment fail is that somebody's treating something that's not epilepsy. And we see that all the time. There are many paroxysmal spells that children have, and seizures are paroxysmal spells but so are other things. And so sometimes movement disorders, sometimes reflux with Santa Cruz syndrome in an infant, sometimes syncope gets treated as epilepsy. And epilepsy drugs don't work very well for those conditions. In adults, the commonest non-epileptic event that gets treated as seizures are psychogenic seizures or paroxysmal non-epileptic seizures. And uh, up to 40% uh, of patients that get referred to an epilepsy center, to an adult epilepsy center for brain surgery, have pseudo seizures. And on average, those people have been treated for 20 years in the community and get referred because they have uncontrolled seizures. And uh, they've just been misdiagnosed. So, what are our treatment goals for epilepsy? Well, when we first diagnose epilepsy and we first start treatment, our goal is to make the child seizure free. We're gonna use our best drug 
If that drug doesn't work, we'll try our second best drug. And our goal is to make the child seizure free. What happens if we don't? So the child has failed two or three, or by the time they get referred, five or 10 or 12 drugs. Well, the first step is always EEG video monitoring. We want to see what the seizures look like with the EEG running to understand exactly what type of epilepsy the child has and to make sure that the episodes that have failed to respond to treatment are actually seizures. An EEG video monitoring with a good MRI also helps us understand whether the child is a candidate for potentially curative brain surgery. And our goal for brain surgery is to make people seizure free. If children aren't a candidate for brain surgery, and there's lots of reasons why you might not be a candidate, then there's always more drugs. And that's when we would consider the ketogenic diet and vagus nerve stimulation. And we don't cure epilepsy with those treatments. So that's why they're always a second choice to brain surgery. And our treatment goal there is to do the best that we can, maximize quality of life, which means having as few seizures as possible and as few long-term side effects from our treatment as we can. So we have class one evidence that tells us that brain surgery works. So in Canada, there was a trial done in London, Ontario, where they took 40 patients um, and offered them surgery and 40 patients had continued on drug therapy and then they compared them a year after. The people that got surgery, over half of them, close to 6%, were seizure free. And the people that continued on drug therapy during that year, only 8% were seizure free. So statistically, surgery was dramatically more effective. Quality of life measures were much better for the surgery group than for the drug treatment group. There were four surgical complications. They were minor infections, a couple of uh, minor complications, a couple of infections. And tragically, one person died in this trial, and it was a person that was in the drug treatment group, and they died, died from SUDEP or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So there's no question that epilepsy surgery is effective and safe and should be offered for people that are candidates. So how are we doing in the United States with getting people to epilepsy surgery? Well, there's a, an enormous treatment gap. So in the United States, there's about 3 million people with epilepsy. And if we said conservatively, if you remember what I said earlier about if they were enrolled in a drug trial, we could get 65% of them seizure free. So conservatively, 35% are still having seizures. Um, you know, I think the number is over 50%, but really conservatively speaking, there's a million people right now in America that are living with uncontrolled seizures, a million people. And every year, there's 150,000 new cases of epilepsy diagnosed. And a third of those, so 50,000, are gonna be medically intractable. So you've got a million people and every year you're adding 50,000. So if we were treading water, not making progress, but just, just keeping our nose above the water, we'd be doing 50,000 surgical procedures in the United States a year. But shockingly, we're not. So we do about 3,000 epilepsy surgeries, brain surgeries, and put in about 4,000 vagus nerve stimulators and responsive nerve stimulators, neuro paces a year. And on average, people wait 20 years to get surgical intervention. So these are numbers that I think people might imagine if I just put up a map of the world, I said, which country do you think is only doing 7,000 surgical procedures when there's a million people that are waiting and 50,000 added every year. I don't think most people would pick America. So what's going on? Why aren't people getting cured? 
If this was brain tumors, do you think this would be the number? Do you think people would say, no, I got diagnosed with a brain tumor. You know, I'm doing okay with the medicine. You know, the steroids, I'm getting a little bit puffy, but you know, it's helping with the headaches. You know, the, you know and I'm gonna wait about 20 years to get cured of brain surgery. Is that what people would say? No. They'd say, I want surgery right now. Dr. Shafron's in the back. When can he do it? Well, I think this is one reason why people don't want brain surgery for epilepsy. Is that this is standard of care. It's a craniotomy. So you have to open the child's head through a standard frontal temporal craniotomy. And sometimes we, and here's the brain, um, and sometimes we have to do what we call phase two monitoring, which is putting these grids in uh, to map out precisely where the seizures are coming from. And then we cut out a part of the brain. It's kind of not appealing to a lot of people. And there are people that um, are really good candidates for brain surgery that say, I just don't want to go through that. So my team and I at Texas Children's, where I directed the epilepsy program for 15 years, um, work to develop a minimally invasive approach that could help some of these people and hopefully decrease that treatment gap. So what's it take to have a minimally invasive epilepsy surgery? Well, it takes technology. Unfortunately, we have a lot of these here at Phoenix Children's and some of them um, I'm just in the process of bringing here. So we need to maximize the non-invasive workup, so not always putting those grids in if we don't need them. I'm mapping out important structures in the brain, non-invasively, to know where motor systems are, where language is. Do the minimally invasive monitoring, and then do minimally invasive surgery at the end. So this is that standard craniotomy. And what we've been able to do, instead of opening the skull and creating a surgical corridor um, and taking out part of the brain, we can do it through a tiny little three millimeter pinhole and using a MRI guided laser catheter. So these are the technologies that we need. Um, and as I said, we have many of these here at Phoenix Children's. So we need to be able to monitor the brain using a lot of electrodes. And we're in the process of, of buying more amps to be able to do, do this now. We want to be able to do three dimensional modeling uh, using computers of understanding where the brain the seizures are coming from. Um, and there's different ways that we use computer analysis for that. Uh, we do spec scans here, uh, which is great. We have a nice PET scanner here. Um, I'm going to be talking in a minute about uh, what resting state functional MRI is. Uh, we don't have a MEG scanner, but uh, uh, MEG is coming to Arizona and it's coming to uh, to Phoenix, uh, St. Joe's is, is in the process of, uh, of buying a MEG scanner. Um, and then functional cortical mapping uh, outside the brain, which is available at a couple of the hospitals in town, but not here. So functional uh, MRI is, is really important. And uh, it's really a great technology. And it, uh, it originally started out as task-based fMRI. We have that here, and the uh, uh, neuroradiology team here does a really good job of task-based fMRI. But the challenges with task-based fMRI is that you have to have a cooperative patient who can lie quietly inside the magnet, not move, and do a task repetitively. So that's not most children with epilepsy. Most children with epilepsy are either too young to be able to do this, or they have developmental or behavioral uh, comorbidities that don't allow them to lay quietly in the magnet. So this is mostly done on teenagers and adults. But you get them to do a repetitive task. So they, they're laying there quietly in the MRI and they move their finger. And you can image in the, uh, if I move my right index finger, you can image uh, the part of the brain that's responsible for moving my finger. And uh, I can think of a word, I can think, you can ask somebody to think of all animal names that begin with B. And uh, as I'm processing that, I can image 
that uh, like the expressive language center that is creating those words. Um, and I can listen to a sentence and process it, and I can image where my receptive language center is. So it's pretty good with that. What you have to have are cooperative patients. So we can image motor systems, we can image visual systems, I can get people to look at things, receptive and expressive language, but it's not good for imaging memory. So it's nearly replaced the WADA test. Um, we did a WADA just a, a week ago, but you know, big epilepsy centers only do a couple of WADA tests a year now, whereas we used to do it you know, a couple of times a week. Um, and it's the gold standard for lateralization of language and memory. We anesthetize half of the brain and then test what the other half can do using a short acting barbiturate called Amatol. So we don't do WADAs very much anymore. But all of these limitations of task-based fMRI led to the development of resting state fMRI. And resting state is amazing. So you can image all these networks in the brain that control movement, control language, uh, with the person laying quietly, so resting state with their eyes closed, or they can be asleep, or with the child, you can sedate them. And the MRI just listens to the brain, takes about 20 minutes, and it measures the functional connectivity between the different parts of the brain. And we can image very clearly where the motor pathways are. We can image where language is, even in an infant before they start talking. We can tell if the language is gonna be on the left side of the brain or the right side of the brain. It's amazing technology. And all it takes is the patient to be in a magnet for 20 minutes. And uh, it's actually very good at determining IQ because people with normal intelligence have different networks and different connectivity than children with mental retardation or autism. And uh, we can all also image pathologic networks that underlie epilepsy. So we can see where seizures come from and how they spread through the brain using functional MRI. So beginning in May, um, I've recruited one of my partners from Houston, Marina Borwinkle, who's the world leading expert on functional, resting state functional MRI in children. And we're gonna be doing this here at Phoenix Children's uh, very soon. We also use uh, different types of monitoring for phase two if we need to. And we had a robot, we're hopefully gonna get a robot here and we can put in multiple depth electrodes into the brain instead of opening the brain with a craniotomy, we can put little wires into the brain to record where seizures are coming from. But all this led to the development of using um, laser. And uh, I was at Texas Children's at the, it was across the street from MD Anderson and MD Anderson is the largest cancer hospital in the world. And they were using this laser technology to destroy recurrent brain tumors. And it seemed like it was very precise and accurate. And I thought that maybe we could adapt this for use in children. It's been around for a while. The technology was developed about 20 years ago by a company actually in Houston called Visualize. And then another competitor has come along called Monteras. And it happens all in the MRI scanner. So we can use the anatomic accuracy of MRI imaging and destroy parts of the brain under MRI guidance using the laser. The laser catheter is only 1.6 millimeters, so like the size of your pencil lead. And uh, we have irreversible complete damage of brain tissue or any tissue in your body instantaneously at 60 degrees. Um, at 50 degrees, you can start to kill brain um, depending on how long it, it, it's exposed. So at 50 degrees, it takes about 20 seconds to kill cells. And we keep the ablation under 90 degrees because we don't want the brain to boil. So we uh, control the thermal energy output of the laser and we keep it between 50 and uh, 90 degrees. If, we, if the brain boils, it creates steam and then that uh, steam is bad inside your head. So this is FDA cleared 
and it's approved just like any other surgical tool. So it's not approved for epilepsy, it's not approved for brain tumors, it's approved like a scalpel is approved. So a surgeon can use this to destroy any part of the body. So this is used for liver tumors, for uh, renal tumors, for prostate, uh, but it's really great for the brain. And in a complete ablation, it'll take uh, you know, about a minute. And it's very precise, so the drop off between 100% tissue destruction and 100% tissue viability is less than a millimeter. So we can take the ablation right up to a critical pathway, or create it right up to the hypothalamus in the hypothalamic hamartoma without causing damage. So there's important considerations in epilepsy. This is obviously much less invasive. Instead of a craniotomy, it's a three millimeter twist drill incision or hole. Seems really great for deep-seated lesions. Uh, the best targets need to be relatively small. And I'll show you some examples. Um, and there's always the danger of being too precise and not getting enough to stop the epilepsy. So this is what it looks like. So instead of the craniotomy, um, this is our access to the skull. So this is uh, uh, the bolt that gets screwed into the skull, and that's the laser catheter that's going into his brain. Uh, we don't shave the head uh, afterwards. We often don't even put a stitch in. So that's, that's what he looks like post-op. So it's, it's, it's much more appealing when a family is looking at, well, what's it take to do brain surgery? And they look at that picture of a craniotomy or they look at this. So when we did our first study of, of 20 patients, uh, we didn't have anybody say no when we offered this to them instead of a craniotomy. So here's an example of an HH, a hypothalamic hamartoma. You can see it's deep in the middle of the brain. So to get to that, you have to create a surgical corridor from the outside for the surgeon to get in. But with the laser catheter, we can come right through the white matter pathways and get to it just like this is going in. We often use a, we typically use a frame-based approach. So the child's bolted to a frame for 3D navigation. And then the surgeon can get the catheter exactly into the middle of our target. We use three-dimensional planning software to be able to calculate our trajectory to get it there safely. So when I first started to propose this, uh, went to our IRB, we had a research protocol, and we chose 20 patients uh, that we thought were candidates for brain surgery, and we did this instead. They were two to 18 years of age, they all had intractable focal epilepsy. And, uh, and by the time I left, we had done a total of 156 children this way instead of a craniotomy. That was our first paper. This is the very first case we did. So I chose a child with tuberous sclerosis. Um, and you can see that he's got, this is an axial flare. You can see that he's got subtle tendable nodules and he's got these tubers in his brain that are causing uh, developmental delay and epilepsy. And we mapped out that his epilepsy was coming from this tuber. So that's what we had to take out to stop his seizures. And that's a good candidate for a traditional brain surgery. And to do this with a craniotomy, a surgeon would do a big opening over here and would probably take out the frontal pole in order to be able to get to that target. This is all that needs to come out, but to get there, you kind of have to sacrifice the frontal pole in order to get there. And you know, most of us just need one frontal pole for uh, processing and for our personality. So as long as you just take out one frontal pole, and you, you don't really change a person, but you're still sacrificing brain that you otherwise don't really need to take out. So we thought that this would be a good case for the laser. So there is the laser catheter in, there's the surgeon drilling the hole. And uh, this is uh, the ablation, the thermal map, the ablation. So anything that is orange is dead tissue. And we watch it happen in real time in the magnet. So the patient's in the magnet, we turn the laser on, and we watch it destroy the brain pixel by pixel. This is an accelerated uh, time scale. It takes about a minute to create an ablation that big. And uh, we do 
uh, enhancement afterwards, and you can see a ring of death. So anything uh, inside that ring is dead. So there he is a year and a half later. The lesion is destroyed. It's just a hole in his brain. And he's been seizure-free since then. So we thought, well, maybe we could do this for mesial temporal sclerosis, the commonest cause of intractable epilepsy in adults and also affects children. The challenge with uh, mesial temporal sclerosis is that you have scarring in your hippocampus, which is also deep. So in order to get that out, most surgeons take out the entire temporal lobe. So you do an anterior temporal lobectomy, you're targeting something this big, and you're taking out something the size of my fist to get there. It works well, it's very effective, but you're sacrificing brain, a surgical corridor to get down to your target. So we thought that this could also benefit from laser. So here's the patient, and there's an axial, those are his eyeballs. That's the medial temporal lobe that's scarred. You can see that it's a brighter color than this side. So we have to destroy that target. So we decided to go in occipitally. Here's the laser catheter coming in. And we were gonna do a couple of ablations. So we can do a single ablation, or we can do an ablation that we can pull the catheter back, do another ablation, pull the catheter back. So we can create a sphere, or we can create a cylinder um, of destruction. And here's that ablation. Uh, that's, those are the pictures after it's done, and here's the ablation starting. And this is the post-ablation enhancement. So you can see that that hippocampus is now enhancing with gadolinium because it's destroyed. And there he is uh, a year later, and the hippocampus is destroyed and gone. And all of the rest of his temporal lobe is still there. But my real target for this technology was hypothalamic hamartomas. And as you may know, this causes a devastating, catastrophic form of childhood epilepsy. The seizures start within the first weeks of life, and the children have gelastic seizures. Gelastic comes from the Greek word gelos, which means laughter, and these children have laughing seizures. And uh, it's associated with a progressive cognitive impairment. They become uh, severely mentally retarded, and they have profoundly aggressive and dangerous uh, violent behavior disorders. So, uh, and typically they have dozens of these seizures a day and they're very, extremely refractory to treatment. The challenge with HH is that the hypothalamic hamartoma is right in the middle of your brain. So how are you gonna get there surgically? It's very challenging. Um, and the HH is connected to normal hypothalamus. So it's very difficult to get the HH out without damaging the normal hypothalamus. Traditionally, depending on the size and exact location, there's two surgical approaches. Uh, one is to come through the top, so you come do a craniotomy just off to the side, you pull the hemispheres apart, you come down, you cut the corpus callosum, come down between the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, and from all this distance, you're scooping out the HH. Um, some surgeons are very skilled at doing this, but it's really hard to do, and it's fairly morbid, and most of the time you cause some uh, injury to the hypothalamus. The other way is coming under uh, sort of the eyeball and coming down um, under the frontal lobe and getting there. You can also approach this endoscopically um, and uh, put an endoscope in through the ventricle and come down and get it. But all of those techniques, it's very hard to see the border between the HH and the normal hypothalamus. But here on the MRI scan, we can see it really clearly. But you can't see that in the MRI scan, or in, in the operating room. So here's our first case, the laser catheter coming down, and we're able to very precisely destroy the HH. And there it is, enhanced afterwards, um, destroyed without damaging anything else. And that's, you know, the patient a year later. Uh, we've done this in all different kinds of patients, including patients that had a traditional 
craniotomy the first time and they just weren't able to get it all. And here's the remaining HH and the laser catheter in it and we were able to destroy it. So at the time I left, these are the kind of cases that we had done. We had done a lot of uh, HH cases. Uh, we've done focal cortical dysplasia, tuberous sclerosis, um, mesotemporal lobe epilepsy like uh, mesotemporal sclerosis. We've done it using, done it to do a corpus callosotomy and periventricular nodular heterotopias. So a lot of the things that cause childhood epilepsy we're able to approach with this. Um, this is our outcome. The HHs do the best. Uh, most of them are Ingo class 1A, which means they're completely seizure free. So these are a summary of our outcomes. 82% of our HH patients were seizure free after a single ablation. But what's great about this is that 95% of our patients go home the next morning. So with a standard craniotomy, children spend five to seven days in the hospital. With an HH where there may be hormone problems, they can spend a month or two in the hospital. And 95% of our patients, no matter what type of lesion, went home the next morning. So if you're talking about healthcare utilization, this is dramatically uh, better. It's, it's actually technically outpatient brain surgery because they're in the hospital for less than 24 hours. Uh, we've not had a single case of diabetes insipidus with the HH cases. We've had no symptomatic hemorrhages from putting the catheter in. We, we do uh, an, a uh, vascular study first so that we avoid putting this through any blood vessels. Uh, we've not damaged anything we didn't want to damage except one case. So early on in our experience, we did an HH case where we damaged the, damaged the child's memory. And this was a, a sad case. He was a 15 year old that came from another major epilepsy center. And he had these unusual seizures uh, where he smiled and he used to laugh. And uh, the doctors thought that, that they were uh, temporal lobe seizures. His temporal lobe looked normal on the scan. Uh, so they thought it was non-lesional temporal lobe epilepsy. They took his temporal lobe out. Uh, he woke up, smiled and laughed. Um, not because he was happy, because he was still having his seizures. And it was after the surgery that when they took his temporal lobe out, they saw the HH dangling there and realized after they had done the surgery that they hadn't recognized that he had a hypothalamic hematoma. So they took the wrong part of his brain out. They sent him to us and uh, we said, oh, we can take care of this. And uh, we put the laser in, destroyed the HH. But uh, unfortunately, um, we had, uh, in the early protocols, we had set the thermal limit at 50 degrees so that the laser gets turned off by the computer if we mark critical structures like his remaining uh, mammillary body and mammillary tract because they had taken his uh, right one out, so he only had one. And we had set it at 50 degrees. And 50 degrees shouldn't... Uh, cause damage if it's only heated for you know, less than 10 or 20 seconds. And we didn't realize that it was getting hotter for longer than that. So we caused a little, we cooked his, uh, his uh, remaining, his only one remaining uh, mammillary body just a little too much. And that caused a memory impairment. So we woke up with uh, having trouble remembering new things, uh, but he recovered pretty well. Um, he never got back to his baseline, but he was still able to go to college. But uh, since then, we've changed our protocol, and we have the safety markers go off at 48 degrees instead of 50 degrees, and we've never damaged anything that we didn't intend to since then. So in conclusion, refractory epilepsy is a catastrophic disease. Management should focus on maximizing quality of life, which means stopping the seizures, minimizing the adverse effects of our therapy, and getting kids off drugs if we can. The ability to identify refractory patients early in the disease is possible because we know that if somebody has failed two drugs, drugs are never gonna stop the seizures. Non-pharmacologic treatments should be considered as soon as drugs fail, especially potentially curative ones like brain surgery. 
exciting and innovative new treatment options are rapidly emerging. So uh, there's an issue, initiative here for people to get uh, maintenance of uh, certification uh, uh, time for uh, answering questions after a grand rounds. Um, I didn't get my slides in early enough for us to have the audience response. Um, but here's, here's my question. So which of the following features suggest that a child may be a favorable candidate for curative epilepsy surgery? Which one of these? They have to have intractable epilepsy. They should have a single seizure type. They should have clinical and EEG findings that point to the seizures being focal in nature and coming from a single region of the brain. And the seizure onset focus is separate from critical structures like motor and language systems, or all of the above. So it's all of the above. I've explained that we have class one evidence that brain surgery is safe and effective. The best candidates to be seizure free have a single focus that you can clearly define. And the best candidates have lesional epilepsy. So if you can see something on the MRI scan that's responsible for the epilepsy, those patients are most likely to be seizure free with brain surgery. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, um, gamma knife and cyber knife therapies have been used uh, to try to treat epilepsy. There was a national trial um, that tried to uh, understand whether uh, gamma knife was going to be effective for mesotemporal sclerosis, um, and it just doesn't work very well. Uh, they, they had to abandon the trial because they couldn't get enough patients to sign up for it. And, uh, and you know the, the big disadvantage of radiotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy, is that it takes about a year for the brain to die after you irradiate it. And most people, when they come to epilepsy surgery, want something done now. And uh, so if you give them the treatment and they say, okay, well, you know, come back in a year or two and we'll figure out if this ever helped you. It, you know, it's kind of unappealing to a lot of people. Um, so, uh, so people don't really use gamma knife very much. It was also used uh, and has been used fairly extensively in Europe to treat uh, hypothalamic hamartomas, uh, but no one except this one guy in France has been able to reproduce his results. Um, and, uh, and so, and especially now that we have such a better definitive treatment uh, for the smaller HHs like the laser, uh, you, you wake up and you're seizure free. So uh, the other technology that looks a little bit more promising uh, for focally, non-invasively, completely non-invasively destroying a focused area of the brain is ultrasound. Um, and that's being explored right now um, for, it, for epilepsy, uh, where you can use focused ultrasound and, and destroy a fairly small area of the brain. Dr. Schaffer. So that's a, it's an active discussion point in the epilepsy community now that we have something that's so minimally invasive. We would never previously have offered someone a craniotomy if they had well-controlled epilepsy. Because the idea of brain surgery wasn't to get you off drugs, it was to stop the seizures. And if you had seizures that were controllable with drugs, we didn't really want to do a craniotomy for that. Um, now that we have a minimally invasive approach, it's reopened that discussion. It ends up though that if you look statistically at how likely somebody is to come off drugs after successful brain surgery, and success means that you're seizure free, only about half the people that are seizure free after brain surgery can actually stop their drugs. So, but having a minimally invasive approach would still 
you know, as far as I know, no one's doing that yet, but I know the discussion is happening. So if somebody had a, you know, a clear focal cortical dysplasia that uh, was responsible for their epilepsy, but they're taking a drug or two and it's stopping the seizures, maybe you could go in and destroy that uh, dysplasia and have the hope of weaning them off their drugs. So it's an active discussion. Yes? Well, it doesn't replace uh, grids in certain patients. So at, at epilepsy surgery conference, when we're deciding what the best approach is for a particular patient, there's a fork in the road. Um, if it's an ablatable target, then we'll plan to build the case using uh, and getting all the information gathered that we need to use the laser. If it's a lesion or a type of epilepsy that isn't amenable to laser ablation, then we'll go along the craniotomy route. <clears throat> At Texas Children's, where we were doing about 120 brain surgeries a year, 30 to 40% of them were laser and the rest were craniotomy. So uh, there's still an important role for a craniotomy. The, uh, the biggest zone of destruction that we can create with the laser um, is about two centimeters. So the target needs to be relatively small. So we're not doing lobectomies um, or multilobar resections uh, with the laser. So the, you would still need a craniotomy. And if you needed to do phase two mapping to uh, understand exactly where the seizure onset zone was and where critical cortex was, you would still do a grid for that. If you need phase two mapping uh, with a laser ablation candidate, then you use depth electrodes. And uh, you know, for tuber sclerosis, for example, a child could have three or four tubers. Um, you know from scalp EEG that you know the epilepsy is coming from this region, but there's multiple potential targets. So you just put a depth electrode in each one, record where the seizures are coming from, and then you can take the depth electrode out put the laser catheter in that same exact trajectory and then destroy your target. So, uh, so laser ablation is really amenable to multiple targets or multiple potential targets uh, in combination with depth electrode recording. Yes? Is Medicaid paying for this? Yeah, yeah, they're excited about it because it costs them less money. Um, so there's still, you know, you're still, it's still, it's still not cheap. Um, so it costs about two thirds to three quarters of the cost of a craniotomy for anesthetic time. The, the surgeon bills for the same time. As, uh, so the, the CPT code is the same for you know, doing a craniotomy to remove a seizure focus or using the laser to res So the surgeon gets paid the same. Um, but, uh, but the hospital costs and anesthetic costs and things like that are less. And then there's a huge savings for time in the hospital. Um, and as we move from an RVU-based uh, reimbursement to a DRG system, something like this would be vastly advantage, you know, advantageous for a hospital to use this instead of a craniotomy. Do you know the economics, for example, like whether you put a kid on dialysis or you transplant them? You know, the nephrologists say after a certain number of years, the transplant actually is cheaper than the, than the dialysis. Uh, what would be the similar ratio for surgery as far as if you if you were just making a case to a third party payer that if you pay this much up front for the surgery, you know, your long term costs are going to be this compared to if you don't, they're going to be this. Oh, surgery is dramatically more cost effective since we're talking about a lifelong disease. So the place where the technology that has been studied most extensively for uh, for the pharmacoeconomics of, of it, or the, it's not pharmacoeconomics, but of the medical economics is vagus nerve stimulation. So VNS, which you know, is an implantable device that stimulates your left vagus nerve that helps control seizures, almost never makes people seizure free. So it just reduces your seizure burden. And a number of very sophisticated studies have been done at, by payers and uh, and a national Medicaid uh, evaluation study um, through CMS um, 
looked at, well, is it really worth putting this thing in because it costs quite a, lot, a bit for the device and the surgery? You know, is that cost effective versus just treating the patient's seizures? And for VNS, which is like just a tiny bit as effective as brain surgery, VNS pays for itself within a year and a half with cost savings by uh, you know, fewer ER visits and, and things like that. So, uh, so brain surgery you know, pays for itself you know, within a year of people getting it just because you're stopping the seizures. Thanks so much.